All right. Amen. Tremendous video. I want to welcome everybody uh, this morning, especially if you're watching it online. Just to remind you, you can watch our services online. You know, before I preach this morning, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what happened last week. We had just a tremendous week last week. We had Mission Sunday, and uh, what we did is we announced all the missions trips uh, for 2019, and we had a tremendous response, people signing up to go on a missions trip. And so I'm going to have the ushers give out some um, brochures. If you did not get one of these, just lift your hand. We want to make sure you get one of these and uh, look, take a look at it. And, and uh, just uh, we want to tell you what's going on for these trips. Because any of these trips that we're taking, we're taking six of them, uh, anybody in this church can go on them. And uh, it is a life-changing experience to go on a missions trip. And so I just want to quickly, uh, as you get these brochures, just go over the places we're going. Uh, one, we're going to Nigeria in Africa. Uh, it's going to be tremendous. Pastor Emmanuel's there. That's in June. Uh, London, England, Pastor Clement, his church. Uh, it's going to be a tremendous opportunity to be in London. Uh, Wichita, Kansas, that's the, uh, the only one in the United States. Very inexpensive one uh, to go on. Uh, then uh, Fiji, uh, that is in the month of August. Uh, that's where we were missionaries. Um, then Colombia, man, how cool is going to Colombia? Praise God, that's going to be a great trip. That's going to, actually, the dates we had to change, it's going to be September 24th to October 1st. And last but not least, uh, Romania. Uh, so uh, it's an opportunity of a lifetime uh, for you to get involved. The three main trips are Nigeria, Colombia, and Kansas. So if you can go one, one of them, it will change your life. And so you can sign up right outside in the lobby, right across from the welcome desk. That's where you can sign up. And uh, there's a lady named Broomy out there. She'll help you out. She'll give you, fill you in any questions. And if you already have signed up, uh, you can um, uh, basically get your deposit in. They have to be in by the end of the month, and you can be involved in something that's amazing. Well, today we are starting our new sermon series called Roadmaps. And most of you got one of these booklets uh, that you, uh, when you came in, uh, you can keep notes on it. It's just a nice little thing that you can have and, and use. But uh, this series is about our journey through life, trying to follow the will of God. And over the next seven weeks, we're going to look at different aspects of that journey, things like preparation, direction, endurance, detours. And today we're going to look at the element of faith on our journey to follow the will of God for our lives. Now, you know, as you watch that video, and which it was an amazing video, by the way, uh, just really, that's, that was all done uh, in-house with, uh, you know, a, a girl from the church. And as you're watching that video, you know, here's this young lady. She's on a journey, and she has a map, and she's just following the map, and it's telling her where to go, and she just follows that map. But how many people realize here this morning that our journey through life is not like that? We don't have a map. We don't have a, G, a GPS. Uh, Siri's not going to tell us where to go and how to get there. But it's a walk of faith where each and every day we are trying to just follow what Christ is leading us to do in our lives. I remember the day I gave my life to Christ. Um, I got saved when I was a, a senior in college, and I went to this church in my college town, and I gave my life to Christ uh, this one uh, Sunday morning, and I remember coming home uh, from that church service, and I was going to change shirts, and I opened a drawer, and as I opened a the drawer, there was my stash. You guys know what I'm talking about. You're, you know, before you were saved, you had a stash, Okay. And what this stash was is a big bag of bud joints, okay, big old giant joints, and that was my stash, and, and I looked in the drawer, and I immediately knew, amen, that I needed to get rid of that stuff. No one told me to do it. Uh, nobody gave me a brochure about marijuana or anything. I just knew I needed to get rid of it. Now, I was kind of stupid because what I should have done is just thrown it out, but I didn't do that. What I did is I took that big bag of joints, and I went to the room 
room next to mine and a bunch of my fraternity brothers, I lived in a fraternity house at the time, were all hanging out in this one room and I just announced to them, I said, hey, I just gave my life to Jesus. I just got saved today and I'm not going to smoke pot anymore. Do you guys want these joints? <laughs> of course, they all went for it and they got it. And I gave him the joints, and as I'm walking out of the room, one of the guys said, hey, Larry, you know, maybe you can get saved next week too, you know, get some more joints. Like I said, I, I didn't really think that through. I should have just threw it out, but, you know, <laughs> that's what happens. But I remember going back in my room, and I sit down, and I sit there, and I go, now what? What do I do next? You know, what, what, what's, the, what's the next step in my journey? What do I do next? And what it is, is we need to understand is that in our journey of life and living for God and serving God, it's a step-by-step -step journey of faith where most of the time we are just trusting God and he is seeing if we are going to put our lives in his hands. That's what he wants us to do. He actually wants us to put our lives in his hands and trust him that he will guide us in the right way to go. It's faith in God that takes everything within us to do what we need to do to have that relationship with God. And I want to read a verse that is very powerful. It's in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. It says, it's impossible to please God apart from faith. And why? Because anyone who wants to approach God must believe both that he exists and that he cares enough to respond to those who seek him. I want you to pray with me this morning. God, we come to you this morning in, in an attitude of faith and prayer, and we ask you that you would speak to us supernaturally and help us to understand this dynamic of this journey that we have to have faith to do it. And Father, I pray that you would just do supernatural things in our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So as you read this verse, it's very clear. It says it's impossible to please God apart from faith. And you just think of the starting point of our journey in serving God. It starts with salvation. It starts with a time where you give your life to Christ and you say, God, I, 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 I'm a sinner. I'm lost. I need your help. I need you to change me. And you have to have an incredible amount of faith to believe that God will hear you and that he will change you and set you free from your sin. It starts with faith. And then you have to have faith to believe that as you are walking in that journey with Christ, that he is leading you every step of the way. You have to have faith to do that. In the book of Genesis, you know, there is a, a, a man named Abram. Eventually he became Abraham. And God uh, uh, tells him, I want you to go on a journey. I want you to go to a place. And he doesn't give him much information. He basically just gives him a promise, and that's it. And I want to read this story. It's in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 4. And this is what it says. <clears throat> now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and so you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse and if you in you all the families of the earth will be blessed so Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So here it is, God speaks to Abraham and he just gives him a promise and Abraham listens to the Lord and he goes forth in faith and obedience even though he's 75 years old and this is not an easy journey. You know, there was no U-Haul center down, down the road that he could just get a U-Haul and pack up everything and go. This is back in Bible days. It's a very hard and difficult journey but by faith he listens to God and he goes on this journey. In the book of Hebrews it gives us some more, it sheds some more 
more light on what actually was happening. In verse 8 of chapter 11, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith Abraham was called and he obeyed and he went to this place. And the crazy thing about it is he didn't even know where he was going. I mean, how many times do we go on a journey? We don't even know where we're going. Just get in a car and say, hey, let's just go. No, but here it is. This is a massive undertaking by him. But by faith, he goes on this journey. And to top it all off is it's, a, you know, this is a hard situation. He's just going by faith. And this is why he is called the father of faith. He is trusting God, the creator, to guide him into doing something that will change his life and his people forever. The problem is with most Christians nowadays is we will not do what Abraham did. Even though in the age and time we live in is a lot easier to get around. And I'm not just talking about moving either. I'm talking about having faith in God so that he would lead you in the right way on the journey of your life. And there are some problems that crop up that stop us from doing what Abraham did, okay? The, the first problem is this, is that we want all the pieces of the puzzle, okay? You know, God, you want me to go on a journey? God, you want me to follow you? Well, I want all the pieces of the puzzle. I want to know exactly what is going down. I don't want any surprises. I don't want anything unexpected. I want to know exactly what is happening. And maybe before I say yes to going on a journey with you, I want everything mapped out. You know, before everybody had a GPS on their phone, isn't it amazing we have GPSs on our phone? You know, not that long ago, that was like top military thing. We have it on our phones now. But before we had GPSs, we had a thing called MapQuest. How many people remember MapQuest? You guys remember that? Yeah. You know, maybe some of you still use it now. But MapQuest, I mean, that was cutting edge, man. You know, you get on your computer and you needed to go somewhere and you just typed in wherever your address was starting at and then you type in the place uh, that you were gonna go to and then MapQuest would spit this thing out and tell you exactly how to get there. You know, go down this road five miles, turn right, go down this road four miles, turn left and it would get you exactly where you wanna go. And most Christians, they want that for their life. They want God to map quest their life for them. They want God to map it all out. God, I want to know exactly what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, and how it's going to happen. God, you want me to marry this person or not? You know, show me. You know, you want me to take this job? Show me. If you want this to happen, you know, have it all mapped out. Just map it all out for me, Jesus. And it's a map quest journey of life. But that's not how our journey is with God. You know, because if that's the way it was, there would take no trust. It would have no faith involved in that, would it? It just, God would just map it out and you just follow the map. But our journey with Jesus Christ is more like a scavenger hunt. Do you ever go on a scavenger hunt? You know, they give you this clue. And most of the time, it doesn't make any sense. You know, you look at this clue, you know, you know, all this stuff. And you try to figure it out. And then, oh, okay, you figure the clue out. And then it leads you to a destination. And you go to that destination and you find another clue. And you got to figure that out. And, and it leads you to another destination. And then, you know, you're down the road. And it's a scavenger hunt. That's what serving God is like. It's more like a scavenger hunt. It's not like map quest. And it takes us a massive amount of faith to trust God that he's going to give us the clues. He's going to give us the wisdom. He's going to show us, amen, the way to go. But there has to be a lot of faith and trust in him that he's going to do that. That's one problem. Here's problem number two is we want an easy journey. You know, we live in a time and age that everything is so easy. I mean, and I call it Amazon easy. Isn't it easy to order things on Amazon? 
I mean, it's ridiculously easy to order things on Amazon, you know? But like, you, you know, before, you know, if I wanted to get a book, let's just say I wanted to get a book, what I had to do is I had to, uh, okay, I want a so- certain book, I had to get in my car, drive to the bookstore, find a place to park, get out, out of, the, out of my car, go into the bookstore, and look for the book. I mean, you know, and then you have no idea where it's at, and you're looking all over, then you kind of find where the section it should be, and then you ask the people, and they, and they tell you, oh, well, that book's out of stock, of course. Then you got to order the book, right? You place your order, then you drive your car back home, and a week or two later, you have to call the bookstore, because you don't want to drive down there, because they probably haven't gotten it in yet. And so you call them and say, hey, is the book in? Oh, yeah. Then you got to get back in your car, drive down, and get the book. Okay? I mean, it's a long thing. It's not easy. Well, with Amazon, you, knew, you want a book. You go on Amazon, and in 30 seconds, uh, you find the book, uh, and there's all kinds of ways you can buy it. You can buy a new one. You can buy a used one. You can buy the Kindle version, the electronic version. I mean, it's all there, and you just push proceed to check out, uh, and then you put, uh, you know, uh, finish the purchase, and you got your book in two days. It's so stinking easy, Amazon easy. And we want our journey with God to be Amazon easy. Just proceed to check out, place your order. But life's journey is not going to happen that way. You know, it doesn't happen that way. I'm going to read a Bible verse that I really don't like. You know, did you ever read verses in the Bible you don't, I don't like that. (laughs) That's not a nice verse. Well, this verse is a verse that I don't like. As a matter of fact, the first time I heard this verse was it was in a song. A lady sang it. But here's the verse. It's in in Psalms 34, 19. It says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. What? Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. And I told you, I heard it in the song. There was this girl in our church, had a beautiful voice. And she, one Sunday morning, she stands up there and sings a song. Many are the affliction of the righteous. Now she sings, I can't sing. And I'm like, what? Did you just say many are the afflictions of the righteous? I thought when you're righteous, everything is easy. And I didn't even realize that was in the Bible. Later on, I found that's in the Bible? That's an awful verse. Tear that one out of there. (laughs) Many are the afflictions of the righteous. See, I want an easy journey. No problems, no hassles. I want it smooth and calm. I'm not interested in a hard journey. But God does not promise us a easy journey. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Let me say it again. God does not promise us an easy journey. As a matter of fact, he tells us it's going to be hard. He tells us straight up in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. It says, enter through the narrow gate, For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. (laughs) It's going to be a hard journey. It's not going to be easy. Don't be shocked when you go through trials and tribulation and hassles of life and you think, God, what are you doing? And then where's the, the proceed to check out button? There is no proceed to check out button, man. It's a hard journey. God tells us straight out, it's going to be hard. It's, you're going through the narrow gate. You're not going through the broad gate. It's a hard journey. Here's a third problem. You guys still with me this morning? We want others to join us on the journey. You know, did you ever go on a road trip with a bunch of people? Isn't it fun? You know, just recently, I took a team up to Palm Coast and a bunch of guys, and we just had a blast, man. You know, we're driving up there, cutting up and having fun and just... Just having a good time. You know, if I went up there by myself, it probably would have been boring, you know? 
And we like to do things when others join us in our journey in life. But unfortunately, sometimes people will not join you in the journey. And that can be really, really hard on us sometimes. You know, I think about my mom. You know, if there's anybody you want to see come to Christ is your mom, isn't it? Yeah, it's your mom. And when I got saved, I witnessed to my mom. I prayed for her. I fasted for her. Shared the gospel many times. Wrote letters to her. I mean, all these things. But my mom never yielded to God and she died without Christ. I mean, that's hard, man. That's a hard thing to take, that she wouldn't join me in this journey. I remember the day I got called into the ministry. I was in a church service, and, and the pastor preached a, a sermon called The Call of God. And, and I heard that sermon, and, and I knew that God was calling me into the ministry. And I remember he gave an altar call to come up if you felt that calling. And I went up forward, and I went up forward in the church, and, and I looked around me on the left and the right, and there was five other guys with me. And I remember thinking, man, that's cool. You know, we can do this together. You know, these guys will, will you know, have my back, and we can, you know, do this journey together. Well, four of the guys, I never saw them again. <laughs> they, like, just disappeared off the face of the earth. I never saw four of the guys again. The other guy, the fifth guy, he horribly backslid later on. Sometimes others will not follow you in this journey. Maybe it's people that you really love. Maybe it's people that you really care about. Possibly it's a brother, it's a sister, it's a, a grandparent or a grandchild or even a spouse. And it can be very sad sometimes. Amen. But some people will not follow you. It's like a song we sing. It says, you know, though none will follow, you know, I'll still follow. Though none go with me, still I'll follow. I'll still follow you, Jesus. You know, I'm still going to follow you no matter what, no matter if anybody else joins me in this journey. Amen. It's my journey in life. And even if people don't join me in that, I'm still going to follow. Will you follow if others don't join you? Now, here's the fourth problem. And this is probably the worst. Is we want to turn back. We want to turn back. You know, my own personal Bible study, I've been reading the book of Exodus just recently. And if you read in that book, it's about God leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. And, you know, Moses is there, he's leading them, and they're journeying, going through the, uh, uh, the wilderness and it's amazing how often they complain to Moses that they want to go back to Egypt. We want to go back to Egypt. I mean, every little thing that happened, oh, we want to go back to Egypt. Oh, there's no water. Oh, there's lots of water in Egypt. We want to go back to Egypt. They got the Nile back there. There's no meat. Oh, man, back in Egypt, we had carne asada, man. I mean, it was awesome. There's a war on the horizon. Oh, we don't want to be in any war. We'll go back to Egypt and be slaves. And the Egyptians, they'll protect us. And the whole time, they just wanted to go back, go back, go back to Egypt. Thank God the Lord didn't let them do that. Because they never would have entered the promised land if they went back. But that's how sometimes we are. We have a tendency that we want to go back. Oh, it's so hard. It's so tough living for Jesus. I want to go back to my good old sinner days. Really? Your good old sinner days? Are you talking about your good old sinner days where you'd wake up with a hangover and you felt like Woody Woodpecker was on your head? Is that the good old sinner days you're talking about? Or the times where you'd wake up uh, on a Sunday or even a Monday morning and you'd look in your pockets and they were empty, your whole 
paycheck was blown and you don't even know what you spent it on? Are you talking about those good old days? Really? See, we want this ability to go back and God all the time is trying to push us forward. He's saying, no, there's nothing back there. Go forward. Keep moving forward. Back there, there's nothing but misery and heartache. That's why Paul says in Philippians, this is a great two verses in chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. He says, brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul's saying, man, I'm forgetting all that junk in the back. I'm forgetting about all that stuff back there. I am moving forward. I'm pushing forward in what lies ahead. And we all need to do that push forward in our lives. Press towards the goal. Amen. There was no turning back with Paul. There was no reverse. There was no neutral. See, a problem with a lot of Christians is their life is in neutral. Okay, they're not going in reverse. They're just kind of stationary. And they're not making any progress in their spiritual life. They're just kind of stuck there. But Paul's saying, I want you to press on, man. Press in. Move forward. Because when we turn back or we are put it in neutral, we miss all that God has for us. Amen. Because he has a thrilling adventure, a journey of life. Amen. Is it scary? Of course it's scary. Is it sometimes like hard? Yes, it is. Amen. But it's a thrilling journey to live for God. It's an awesome adventure to live for Jesus Christ. And when we turn back, we miss all that God has in store for us. We miss it because we're too busy turning back instead of going forward. You know, I want to close this sermon with an illustration. And I honestly don't know if it fits, but I think it does. And I hope that you get my point from it. But many years ago, my brother came out to visit me when I lived in California and at the time, and, and what we did, we decided we were going to go to this water park, you know, with water slides and all this stuff. And at the time, this water park had the highest water slide in the United States. I think it might have been the highest water slide in the world at the time. This is years and years ago. And there was probably bigger ones nowadays, but back then, this was a high water slide. It was about eight stories high. Okay, so you had to walk up eight flights of stairs to get to this thing. And I remember me and my brother were at this water park, and we see that, and we go, hey, man, we're going to go on that thing, you know. So we start climbing up the stairs, and I'm thinking, man, you know, this is hard, man. There's eight flights, you know, and it, it, it's getting high, and, you know, we're getting high, higher and higher. And then when you get to the top, there's a platform that you have to climb up to to get to the thing. So it's almost like another flight of stairs, and we have to climb up there. So we're about nine flights of stairs up there. I mean, we are high. And I remember there's an attendant there by the slide. You didn't, couldn't go down by yourself. And then we walked over to it and we looked down and we're like, are you kidding me? It's like straight down, like straight down. It's like we're going to hell or something. And I'm looking and then I looked over at my brother and he looked at me and we're like, eh, we're not going down this. We're not going down. So we're going to go back. We're going to go back down. So we're getting ready to kind of climb down. We start just climbing down the platform. And here's this little girl that's climbing up. <laughs> so we got to get back up there. And here's this girl. And I mean, she probably just made the height requirement. You know how they have a height requirement? I mean, she's a tiny girl. She's probably about eight or nine years old. And she just gets up there. She goes to the slide. She lays down. And the tenant pushes her and she's off. I look at my brother, he looks at me, and we're like, you know, the macho starts coming out. There ain't no way a girl's going to do this, and we're going to chicken out. So we're going to go down it. And I'll never forget this. 
Hey, man, you, this slide, you couldn't just go on your own. You had to lay down there, and the attendant had to push you, right? He had to literally push you down the slide. So I'm laying there, and, and the guy goes, you know, you all ready? I go, yeah, I'm ready to die. <laughs> go for it. And so he pushes me, and I am not exaggerating, but I am flying. I am flying. I'm in the, the slide tube, but my body is not touching. I am flying straight down. It was horrifying. And then I get to the end, and I didn't listen to the attendant, of course, when he says, cross your legs. Listen to the attendants. They know what they're talking about. And I had a wedgie for a week. <laughs> but after I hit the pool, there's like a pool at the end, and I got out of the pool, and I got out, and I was like, yeah, I did it. And I'm looking at that thing, and I, I did it. And I'm so glad that I did. I didn't turn back. And it was fearful. It was hard. It was something that I thought I'd never do in my right mind. But it was a thrilling adventure, and I'm glad I did it. Now, granted, I didn't do it again. We didn't say, hey, let's do that again. <laughs> no, <laughs> I wasn't that stupid. <laughs> but it was thrilling, and that's the way life is. You know, so many people miss the thrilling aspects of life because they won't, amen, live in faith with God. They won't take a step of faith. You know, just like last week we had, you know, we talked about missions, going on a missions trip, and a lot of you, you know, you're on the edge. Well, I don't know. And Take a step of faith, man. You won't regret it. Take a step of faith and, and don't turn back. Don't uh, uh, go backwards. Go forward. Forward is so much better than going backwards. But so many Christians, they're either stuck in neutral or they're going backwards instead of moving forward, amen, with God. But in order to move forward, amen, you have to have faith. You have to trust that God is with you. You have to believe that God is going to help you, that God's going to be there for you, that he's going to work things out. We're, we're, we're trying to figure everything out. How's it all work? Amen. Like Dave was talking about tithing. I, it does, I don't know how it works, but it does. God will work it out if you just live your life in faith and believe him that he will help you no matter what the situation. Amen.